appreciate that. He made me sound a lot more important than I really am. But I'm just glad to be a Christian, amen? amen. <laughs> a part of God's family. It's so good to be with you folks. I've been here year after year. Always enjoy it. I'm always blessed by being with you. Appreciate the good singing and the good prayers tonight and uh, getting to uh, shake your hand and talk to you a little bit. Most of you I got to speak to a little bit before, but uh, hopefully I can meet you after I, if I didn't before. But I mean, I appreciate the fellowship of God's people. Just, just to be with you, just to know I have a family here. Uh, one congregation, that's not what it's all about. You know, we've got our congregation over there and, and, and we're busy working and trying to do what we can there. And I know you are doing the same thing here. And I just want to encourage you and bless you with that. But let's not forget, God has people all over the world. He's got congregations, churches of Christ everywhere. And uh, sometimes we get to feeling like we're just this little group, you know, or it's just a few of us. But remember that we're not alone and that, we're, that God is with us and that he is doing great things. And, and I just want to encourage you in that tonight uh, to look at this divine dichotomy. I had to look that word up, by the way. Uh, but I hope by now we kind of know what we're talking about. But uh, in the world but not of the world is what I came up with. Uh, that's kind of a punchy phrase. And. It certainly is a dichotomy that really captures a truth about the followers of Jesus Christ. Amen. And of course, uh, uh, we use it a lot. You're probably familiar with it. Most of you have probably heard it. But what I'm thinking is, as I began to study this lesson in a way I haven't studied before, I, I think it might give a false impression. And I think it also might kind of downplay our real mission as Christians. And so what I wanted to do was kind of run it through the text. Uh, I'm going to be in John 17 tonight. If you're not there yet, you'll want to go there to John 17 because I want us to see how Jesus uses this. When I'm, when I'm looking at it as we've got it set up in the world, not of the world, you, you see how we start in the world here and we move away from the world, not in, not in the world but not of the world. We, like a disassociation from the world and like we're thinking, you know, I'm in this old world, this ruthless world. It's an awful thing. It's an unfortunate thing. Uh, but, but I'm not of the world. I'm going to make all my energies not to be of the world. And certainly we need that emphasis sometimes. But I'm not sure that's where Jesus puts the emphasis when he uses these phrases here in John chapter 17. So I want you to see the Lord's perspective. And I'll read a big bulk of this, John 17, uh, in a little bit later in the lesson. But I just want to remind you. This is before Jesus is going to the cross. He's with his disciples, and now he is alone here giving a prayer to God for his disciples as he is about to lead them, and they're about to be sent out into the world. And so I want you to see a couple of things tonight. We're going to look, first of all, at what does it mean, and then we're going to see what it looks like, and then we're going to see how we can do it. I think all of those things for, are important for us. And so what did Jesus mean when he talked about being in the world and not of the world? And let's notice, first of all, how he talks about being not of the world. If you look in verse number 14 of John 17, he says, I have given them your word, and the world was hated because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And then skip to verse number 16 where he says, They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. You see his emphasis here, and this is where he begins, not of the world. We can all agree that we're not to be of the world, that he is not of the world. But I want you to notice here in John 17 that not of the world, that's where Jesus begins. That's the starting place. That's not the destination. Where do we move? We're not of the world, but where's the movement? Look at verse number 18, where he says, As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And then look at this kind of surprising prayer in the middle of all this in verse 15 when he says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, that you should keep them from the evil one. So I see Jesus identifying the fact that we are not of the world. We are identified with Christ. We have been crucified 
to the world. That's a given. That's who we are. That's who his disciples are. That's who he was, not of the world. But then he moves us, he sends us into the world. You see, there's the emphasis, and there's the force of this prayer. They're not of the world, but I'm sending them into the world. There's our mission, and that's why I would kind of like to reverse what we're saying. We say, not of the world, or in the world rather, but not of the world. But I see Jesus here making this emphasis. Not of the world, but sent into the world. And I hope you can see what he means by that. That his prayer is for his disciples who are not of the world. His prayer is for them as they are sent into the world. Now, what does that look like? Well, when I was a kid, growing up, my, my, my brother and I, we were pretty close. And we were always out playing together. And up across the street, up on the hill there, we had a, a little lake, more of a pond. It had a little spillway on it, but had a little island out in the middle of it. And we decided we're going to buy us one of these blow-up rafts, you know. And the hardest thing about that raft was blowing it up. <laughs> but we finally got that thing blown up. And we took it up the hill and, and put it out on the lake and, we had some paddles, and so we were paddling around the lake. We gave our friends some rides, and it was great for a couple of weeks. And then we got a little hole in the bottom of the boat, and water began to seep in. It was okay for a while, but then that hole got <laughs> larger, and we got other holes, and they got larger. And, and before you know it, all we were doing was scooping water out of the boat. And so what did we do with the boat? Well, we threw it away. We got tired of scooping water. It wasn't doing what it was designed for. It was designed to be in the water. It was designed to float on the water and not sink. It was not designed to take in the water. Now, and I can you begin to see how this is what it looks like to be not of the world, but sent into the world. You see... The, the boat is in the water. It's surrounded by the water, but it's not to take in the water. And, and we, you see, we have been sent to engage this world, but we must not allow our lives to be infiltrated with the morals, the values, the culture of this world. You see? So we, we are those that are in the world, all right, and we're not of the world, but more importantly, we're not of the world, but we're sent into the world. And I think we struggle with that as Christians, trying to keep the water out of the boat, trying to be the boat in the water. I think a lot of us, maybe some of us at least, we just take our boat out of the water altogether. And I think we have good intentions, you know, I, we don't want to be influenced by the world. We want to protect ourselves from the world and our families from the world. There's one problem with that. And the problem is that when we take our influence out of the world, we take the influence of Christ out of the world. You see, our mission is we're sent into the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We, our mission is not to hunker down in a holy bunker. Amen? Amen. <laughs> that, that, but that's where we end up sometimes. Now, on the other hand, we have those, they, you know, launch their boat, but they fail to guard against the influence of the world, and they end up taking in the water. And some Christians I know, they just throw up their hands and surrender. You know, this is too hard. This is too boring. This is too weird. Being a Christian in the world, I can't do this. And they just give it up. But with most, I think it's more like a little by little, kind of like that raft that we had. You know, we kind of ride the fence over here. and We kind of give in over here. Uh, we might even compromise the gospel, the faith, the truth, in some misguided attempt to be relevant So how do we do it? How can we do this? How can we 
be not of the world, but sent into the world. How can we get in this world and be an influence in this world without taking in the influence of the world, being impacted by the world? And I think that's pretty hard. I really do. It's not an easy job. It's difficult. And you see the first century Christians struggle with it just like we struggle with it. It's kind of like taking a boat upstream. You know how hard that is. <laughs> it, it, my wife and I, we went to Niagara Falls a number of years ago, and it was a beautiful place. It's a great trip. If you can ever go there, it's worth it. But I don't want to take a barrel up Niagara Falls. <laughs> it's, it would be almost impossible. And sometimes that's what it feels like when we're trying to be these disciples who've been sent into the world, have an impact on that world. Not of the world, but sent into the world. But Jesus gives us two keys in our text, and that's what I want you to look at here in John chapter 17. I'm going to read with you uh, from verse 11 down through verse, or excuse me, verse uh, uh, 15 down through verse 20. Let's see what it says. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, but just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Well, just a couple of things I want you to notice here. Did you notice how Jesus prayed that God would keep them from the evil one? There's the first key. And did you notice also that he prayed that God would sanctify them with the truth, the word of God? And did you notice in verse 20 that he didn't just pray this for his disciples, the apostles. But he also prayed for all those who would believe on him through their word. He, he's praying for us these same things. And so here's what we need to do. Number one, we need to guard ourselves from Satan. We need to guard ourselves from temptation. We need to take an inventory. You might remember what the Apostle Paul said at the end of that second letter to that church and having so many problems. You know, the church at Corinth, uh, they came out of the worst of paganism. I mean, Corinth was a synonym for wickedness. But now they were in Christ. And when you read Paul's first and second letter, you see they were vexed with all kinds of problems. The, the world was still influencing them. And he wanted them to be an impact on the world. And so he said, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. You take a look. You look close. You look hard. What's your weak points? Where is it Satan is attacking? How is the influence of the world getting into your boat, so to speak? And you ask God to help you. Do you remember Jesus's? we call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's really the model prayer <laughs> by the Lord? We're reading in John 17, the Lord's Prayer. That's his personal prayer. But you remember what he said there? He said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. When's the last time you prayed that? When's the last time you took your temptations, your weaknesses, your struggles to God in prayer, and you ask him, help me with these things, you know? Be with me, guard me, keep me. And here's something else you can do. To make yourself accountable, you get somebody that you trust, another brother, another sister, an elder, a preacher, a, a friend that, that you know in the Lord, and, and, and let's practice James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. You see, that, that's being honest before God and before others who can help me, who can strengthen me, who can be there for me. And so what I want us to do when we get our boat out there in the water, <laughs> is to kind of patch up the holes, okay? And I'm going to give you a passage in the book of James. <clears throat> James chapter 4. I think he sums it up pretty good right here. When we're talking about being on guard from Satan, being on guard from temptation, trying to, you know, to, 
to not let these things in our hearts and our lives. Here's what James says, James chapter 4, verse 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So James says, you, you put your faith, your trust in God. You submit to him totally, completely. You humble yourselves under the mighty hand of the Lord. He's going to lift you up. He's going to encourage you. But you've got to resist. You've got to stand up to the devil. And you've got to have a penitent heart devoted to purity, to holiness. So that, that's what God is telling us. To, let's patch up the holes, okay? And then here's the second thing. Because Jesus prayed that they would be sanctified by the truth, by the word. I'm just telling us, let's immerse ourselves in the word. Immerse yourselves in the word of God, in the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love how Paul kind of puts this in Romans 12 in verse number 1 and verse number 2. After he had laid out the gospel and, and the need for that gospel and the power of that gospel. And, and what he tells us in Romans 12 is, I beseech you by the mercies of God, which he had rehearsed so well. I beg you, I plead with you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know, like they used to put the lamb on the altar. He says, you put your heart, you put your life, you put your body there on that altar. The problem is we kind of keep flopping off the altar, don't we? But he says, you present your bodies once and for all, living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. Don't let this world press you into its mold. But he says, you be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Amen. You see, you let God's word change your heart, change your life. You don't let this world press you into its mold. You don't be conformed to this world. And that's only possible when we really give ourselves to God and, and immerse ourselves in it because we believe in it, because we know it, and because we obey it. We are sanctified. We are set apart. We are made holy by His truth, by His word, day after day, day in, day out, you see. Peter put it this way, 1 Peter 3, verse 15. He, he said, first of all, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. You, you set Him apart, you make Him the Lord of your heart. You let Him sit upon the throne of your heart. He's the ruler. He's the master. He's the king. I'm submitting myself to him. And then he says, be ready always to give answer to everyone who ask a reason for the hope that lies in you, right. yet with meekness and fear. You see, if we've been immersed in his word and he is our Lord, we're submitting in obedience to his will for our life, then we'll be ready and not everybody's going to ask us for the reason for the hope that lies within us, but the more we are unlike this world and we are like Jesus Christ, the more they're going to be asking us, what is this hope that you have? And when they ask us, we're going to be ready because we know the Lord and we know His Word. We know the Gospel. If you're a Christian here tonight, then you've been saved. You know what that's about. You know what you did to become saved. You know what Jesus did for you so you could be saved. You can share that story. You can give that testimony to the world, if you will. And you can do that, as Peter said, with meekness and fear, with gentleness and respect. And you have a tremendous impact upon this world. That's how we do it. Jesus Christ, he's our example, folks. You remember why he came into this world? Luke 19, 10, to seek and to save the lost. That was his mission. And he was committed to that mission. He was determined to finish that mission. He went all the way to the cross to provide for the forgiveness of our sins. That was his part in seeking and saving the lost. 
And the Bible tells us in Matthew eleven nineteen. 19, I think it's a good way to sum up his whole ministry while he was here, that he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners, that he ate and drank with them. He loved people. He loved people that nobody else loved, the tax collector and the sinners. You think about who Jesus hung around his life. I know he had his disciples, his apostles, all, but where were they going? What kind of people were surrounding them? You know, time after time we see those that were hurting, those that need healing, and those that were in need, the poor, the outcast, the unwanted, the unloved. And Jesus' relationship, it wasn't just social. It was redemptive. That's why he was eating, drinking with those tax collectors and sinners. You think he liked what they were doing? No. You think he loved them? Yes. Amen. Think he cared for their soul? Absolutely. He was not of the world, but he was sent into the world to be a friend of sinners, to redeem their souls. That's why he became our redeemer. That's why we've been redeemed, to redeem others. Let me tell you, this world is keenly aware of the fact that they are empty. They are empty. Those that don't have God, they know that emptiness. They know they can't cope with this life on their own. They know that this world is not meeting their needs, their most important needs, their eternal needs. There's good soil for the planning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is how we have the power, those of us who are not of the world, to go into the world. We go into the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what the Bible says in Revelation 12, 11? A book about suffering, about persecution from the Roman Empire upon God's people. That empire would fall, that's what the book is about. But God's people, the church, would stand forever. They'd be delivered. But those folks were suffering because of them being not of the world but sent into the world. They were being imprisoned and they were being cast off by the rest of society. They, they couldn't have jobs and they couldn't uh, trade and have, uh, you know, business. They, these were people that were not only ridiculed and, and made fun of and, and, and isolated, but these were people that were tortured for their faith. These were people that died. They died for Jesus Christ. I mean, Satan was working hard through that Roman Empire to destroy God's nation, the church. But here's what he says in Revelation 12, 11. We can overcome him. We can overcome Satan. We can overcome the evil. We can overcome him, he says, by the blood of the Lamb and by the testimony of their word. You see, we have Jesus. We have the message of salvation. We have the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. We have some good news for this world. That's how we overcome. We're not to have contempt on the world, brothers and sisters. We're to obey the laws of the land as long as that doesn't cause us to quit following Christ. And we're to Submit to whatever suffering we might have to endure at the hand of the world for the cause of Christ. We're to love the people of the world. And we're to pray for them. And we're to tell them about Jesus. We are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Amen. Remember Matthew 5, 14 to 16? That's how we glorify God. Let your light so shine before men they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's our ultimate purpose. But how we accomplish that is through our mission. 
to be that preserving influence, the salt of the earth, to be that light in a world of darkness, to give them the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. We've been redeemed. We've been set free, crucified to the world, but raised to new life to be sent back into the world, given that light to get out of the darkness, but now to use that light as we navigate in the world with the gospel of Christ to rescue others, to, to bring others out. There's our focus, not of the world, but sent into the world. That's Jesus' emphasis. That's what he wants us to get here tonight. And when we get a hold of that, we're not going to get caught up in the world. Amen. The world's going to get caught up in Jesus. So I want to ask you this evening, to whom do you belong? Do you belong to God or to the world? You know, when it comes to Jesus, there is no neutrality. You can't, you can't I'm just going to be neutral with you. I'm not going to take a position. I'm not going to take a stand. He says, you're either with me or you're against me. He said, if you're not with me, you are against me. Matthew 20, verse 30. You can't ride the fence. You know Matthew 6, 24? He says, no man can serve two Masters. They either hate the one, love the other, love the one, despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. You've got to make a choice. You can't keep riding the fence. And Jesus Christ says, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Amen. There's no other way. There's no other one. He's the only answer. You and I, who are in Christ here tonight, we know what that answer is. And the world needs that answer. They're not going to find it if we're over here isolated from the world. And they're not going to find that answer if we keep letting the world in our heart, in our life. So, really, here's what I want to ask my brothers and sisters. Is your boat in the water? <laughs> or is the water in your boat? You know what I'm talking about. And I hope you know tonight that if you're not right with God, you can't help other people to be right with God. So here's an opportunity for you if you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, if you haven't come to Him, confessing Him, making that decision to live for him, to turn away from sin, to let us baptize you into Christ right here tonight, to be cleansed by the gospel of Christ, to be raised up to live a new life. And if you're one of those who've got all that water in your boat, or you have been failing the Lord in accomplishing the mission he's given you to do, then you come, you let us pray with you, let us pray for you. Maybe... You just need to talk to God about this. You know, he says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just be honest with God about where you're at tonight. So he might continue to use you in his kingdom to do his work, to bring redemption to those that are lost. Don't leave here. Now, getting right with God, let us help you to do that tonight as we stand and while we sing. Won't you?